more than ever, perhaps, there's this revolution in non-ordinary states of consciousness and that people are using them to mend trauma, they're using them to access information and inspiration, uh, and they're using them to connect and collaborate in ways that haven't necessarily been possible at this scale before. That's all good news, and that's creating a ton of positive things, both in personal growth and development, adjuncts to different psychotherapies and medical interventions, increases in solving hard problems that we face as entrepreneurs or, or as a society. So we're talking about like microdosing, we're talking about all sorts of different you, experiments. You, you could really, I mean, and certainly the premise that Stephen Kotler and I wrote about in Stealing Fire is that um, it's the neurochemistry we have access to. You know, that's our toolkit. And you can get to it through a bunch of different means. You can use smart tech, you can use meditation, you can use breathing techniques, you can use sexuality, you can use pharmacology, <laughs> you can use dance and movement and music. Really, that to me is the, interest, the most interesting thing of all. It's not what's the flavor of the week and what does a new study tell us. It's that we understand the neurophysiology of human optimization and transcendence. Now, now the interesting thing is no sooner do you have that experience of being able to prompt ecstasis or moments where we step beyond ourselves and you could call flow states there's loads th of different there's, there's, there's a lot of different peak states that would fall under that big tent um, and you end up with you know people bonding very closely with the folks they share those experiences with what Victor Turner the anthropologist would, would call communitas so the moment you have ecstatically inspired community <laughs> then you have to kind of just tackle head-on the question and the liability of the cult because a cult you know most of us when we think of that we think of it in the sort of scandalous terms we think of it in the helter skelter manson family or the jim jones drink the kool-aid side but from you know religious studies or anthropology a cult is literally just a community of practice um, bonded together around some shared ep epiphanic you know or revelatory experience basically it's any religious group that doesn't yet that is not yet state sanctioned is a cult. So the question is, is we know there are dysfunctional ones. We know there are lots and lots of unethical cults, particularly where leaders hijack um, money, power, sexuality, and control. And you may pick, pick any two and you're done. You know? So the question is, is rather than steering away from that and, as, and, and saying that won't happen or it shouldn't happen or, or um, that's not what we're doing, steer into it and say, okay, if we're going to build vibrant communities of practice, how do we build ethical cults? And, and what I would imagine, and, and that's clearly a conversation for us all to figure out, but what I would imagine is that, you know, we, we've seen this movie before, we know how this goes badly wrong, and we've had about a half century of, you know, Eastern hierarchical lineage traditions getting buggered up and bastardized and imported into the West and, and varying kind of gurus with feet of clay stepping up to lead children's crusades, you know, that all just go off the cliff. And so the question would be, if we're trying to build ethical cults, A, you know, are they experimental and experiential so that there is no dogma or doctrine to buy into? Are they decentralized so that people maintain their own common sense, their own judgment and their own agency? And, and are they um, pointed towards, I would hope, some sort of social good or, or action and, and, and can you and, and all of the the known issues of dysfunctional cults can we just say hey let's just forever be vigilant about shared in groups about specific vernacular about an inside outside group mentality about mediated access to ecstasy right and that's another kicker because almost in every single one of those situations where it does go wrong that group does something together that creates a state experience that they come to believe is exceptional, special, and quite often is doled out or tightly controlled by the person in charge. And so if we create distributed access to techniques of ecstasy, so everybody is on their own recognizance, you know, and responsible for having access to these things, integrating them and growing them, there are no fish stories to swallow. So it's, it's open source meaning making. Um, and there's no sage on the stage. There's nobody up front that has lopsided uh, truth or authority claims that maybe we have the chance. And then also, you know, a great one from a lot of religious traditions that seems to get skipped these days is an ethic of service. Are we doing something with this? Or are we just kind of crawling up our asses and engaging in endless self-development? So that would be my hope, is that, is that ethical cult building is the game of how do we create lots of nodes 
all of which are unique and different from each other. They all form with their own kind of local DNA and particular missions and purposes. They may even have their own belief systems, but we can say um, ecstasis, the peak experience, catharsis, the healing, and communitas um, become the kind of three-legged stool that you can basically build tightly knit, highly collaborative, uh, functional and effective small communities around. What's the benefit of creating these kind of flow states in the first place? Well, I think, I mean, the benefits are many and much of the research, you know, starting in the University of Chicago, going through lots of other organizations and, and universities has just been that flow states tend to create um, a lot of positive benefits, including heightened and more precise decision making, a lot of sort of rather than meditation and stillness, it's sort of meditation and action. So you have real time decision making, you have increased problem solving, increased innovation, increased connectivity in group flow situations or like heightened team situations. And then you also tend to have a, a self-reported spike in overall life satisfaction. So on a simplest sense, I guess I kind of think about those peak states almost like when your laptop has been left open too long and you've got too many browser windows open and it starts bogging down and getting glitchy. And that's kind of how we are these days sort of continuous partial attention. There's never a time where we truly decompress. Even on planes now, you know, there's Wi-Fi follows us everywhere. Our smartphones follow us everywhere. The natural rhythms of life have all just been ironed out. Even in the you know, urinals and gas stations, we're getting bombarded with visual ads. There's just no downtime. So most of us are suffering from some version of sort of almost micro PTSD constantly. Our nervous systems are just fibrillating. And so cultivating these peak states is like just doing a cold reset on your laptop. It just lets our nervous systems power down. And then when we come back online, we come back to a neutral balance spot. And from there, we have choice. And it may not last for a long time. We may get overwhelmed with the, with, with the barrage again, but at least we have that bit of space to return to center and start living from there again. And the more regularly we can do that, then that becomes that becomes a known location <laughs> and we can kind of use it to find ourselves again uh, in, with, with the onslaught of you know, all the information. These non-ordinary states, are these what Stan Groff, for example, was talking about? Yeah, absolutely. And, and non-ordinary states literally can mean anything other than waking state consciousness. Um, in stealing fire and in general in the kind of optimal psychology space, we tend to skew to the ones, I mean, schizophrenia would be a non-ordinary state. Dreams would be a non-ordinary state. Manias would be non-ordinary states as well. But I think Stan Groff and, and that the rest of that sort of broad discipline would generally describe them as optimal and helpful states that don't correlate with normal waking consciousness, which is typically fast beta wave neuroelectric activity, prefrontal cortical, executive functional activity, and often, as we said, some form of a mild vigilance or arousal stress response.